Affinity Publisher is a brilliant app for desktop publishing, and I've got 15 tips that will change your brain chemistry as a designer. Everything from managing multiple images at once to generating personalized designs with CSV data, these tips will definitely speed up your workflow and help you level up fast. Tip number one is all about managing photos. If you've worked with any type of desktop publishing software before, you've probably had a headache where you have to go back and forth between different programs like Illustrator and InDesign and Photoshop to manage all of your different assets. The cool thing about Affinity Publisher is that it has Affinity Photo and Designer actually built into it as personas. Okay, I've got this picture in my document and I just wanna cut out the background. I don't need to go into a separate app to do that. I can let Affinity Publisher manage all of the links and everything while keeping all of the stuff right here in Affinity Publisher. So I'll just select this picture frame, go up to the photo persona. I'm gonna make sure that the image itself is selected not the picture frame, but the image itself. Then we're going to go over to our toolbar on the left. And I just want to get that selection brush tool. We'll paint in a bit of a, a selection. If you get any extra things that you didn't want, like this little spot right here, you can just hold the Option key or Alt key on Windows and brush over that to subtract it from the selection. And it can be pretty rough when you're done. You just need to click Refine. And we can see anything that's overlapping here outlined in red. I also like to switch this to black and white. I do want to get some of these extra areas here so I can click foreground and then just brush those in. And when you're happy with your selection, you can output either a selection, a mask or a new layer. I'm going to go ahead and output this to a mask and click apply. And now we can see the background is gone. And now I can move the model around without having to worry about the background. When you're happy with your changes, just go back to the Affinity Publisher interface. All of your layers are still there. And in terms of document linking and all that stuff, Affinity Publisher has managed everything for you. So there's no need to import or shuffle files around. It's all right there within Affinity Publisher. For tip number two, we're going to talk about global swatches. If you're anything like me, managing colors is kind of a tedious process because I, for one, can never decide on a color scheme until the document is done. And I'll spend way too much time just going back and tweaking individual colors. With global colors, it allows you to assign a color swatch to multiple objects and then change that color for everything in the document all at once. So let's see how that works. Here, I've got this business card template and I'd like to be able to save the swatch that are already in here. I'm going to bring the swatch panel out and click the little hamburger menu in the top right. We can see three options here for the application palette, document, and system palette. And we also have an option for create palette from document and the same three options for application, document, and system. Now, when you create these different palettes, it's basically telling you the scope of where they're going to be accessible from. If you create an application palette, it's going to be accessible to any documents that you currently have open. So if you want to share colors between documents, you can do that. If you create a document palette, it's only going to be available within your current document, but that will enable to use global colors. And if you create a system palette, this is kind of like creating a preset. So it'll be stored on your computer and you can use it in other files later. But since we want to use global colors, I'm going to go ahead and create a document palette. And here in swatches, we can see that it's already created swatches for all the different colors in the documents. This is really, really handy. It's also named this for us. It's business cards. And if I want to turn some of these into global colors, I'll need to first convert the swatches to global colors and then assign them as global colors. So let's go ahead and select some of the objects here that we want to use. I'm going to deselect everything and then just double click to get into that group and select this orange shape. I'll go up to the select menu, select same and select the same fill color. So it now has all of the different orange objects selected. There are two buttons over here. One is to add the current fill uh, to the palette and then one other for add the fill as a global color. And that's what we'll go ahead and select. Now you can also right click and convert any swatch you want to a global color, but you still have to apply it. So since I have these all selected, 
to apply them, all I need to do is now click that new global color swatch that I just created. And let's go ahead and deselect everything. And if I want to change that orange for everything in the document at once, I can go ahead and just double click that swatch to open it. And you can see as I drag that hue slider across, it's changing not just one object, but everything referencing that global color. Global colors can save a ton of time and really only takes a little bit of setup at the beginning of your document. And that's why it's one of my favorite tools in Affinity Publisher and tip number two in this list. When you open up a new document in Affinity Publisher, it creates a whole bunch of paragraph styles for you. And if you found those kind of confusing, you're not alone. I found them confusing when I first started using Publisher 2, but there's actually a really helpful hierarchy built in. And I'm going to show you how to use that. All right, so in this document, I've got a business card that I've pasted from a template, and there are no styles applied yet. But when I create this document, I get all of these default styles. Let's drag that text styles box out here. We can see all these different styles. There are three different types of paragraph styles. There's the paragraph style itself, there's character styles, and then there are style groups. And in terms of hierarchy, style groups are kind of on top, and then paragraph styles, and then character styles for specific changes. To see how this works, let's open up the body style. I'll just right click and edit body. In the style editor, we can see on this first page that it's based on base. Looking at our text styles here, we can see that base does not have a paragraph symbol next to it and doesn't have a character symbol next to it either. That means it's a style group. We don't apply style groups to text directly. Instead, we reference them from our paragraph and character style. So this body style is referencing base. We can also see some of the settings here are set to no change. What that means is that it's just taking whatever's in that base group style and it's not applying any changes at all, but it is applying a font size change instead. So let's go ahead and apply the body style to this box on the bottom. We'll click that and then just click body to apply it. You can see that it has a different font, a different size, all that stuff. So let's update the base so we can see what changes filter down through that. So I'll select this box that still has our original style. I'll right click base and click update. And we can see the font changes, but the size does not. It's still large, but the font has now changed. So the font matches our style above. So let's open the body style up again. I'll just right click and then edit body again. We can see on the character panel that the font size is set to 12. We just change that to no change. It's just going to take whatever value is set in the base group that it's referencing and use that. So let's click OK. So let's go ahead and apply that H2 style. Just click the box, click Heading 2. So if we right click on Heading 2, Edit Heading 2, go down into our font size. We can see it's 14 points. Let's go ahead and change that back to 9 because we do want it to be larger than the base group. Go to Color and Decorations and under Text Fill. Let's just drag this down a little bit. Quick Text Fill and this eyedropper to just sample that, that orange color that I had before. We can see that that's now applied. Let's go ahead and apply that body style to our other box here. Now, assume I want to change the font for everything all at once. I can do that directly from the base group style. Uh, all I have to do is right click on it, go to edit base. And if I change this from open sans to say Arial, it's going to filter down to everything that's referencing that base set. Using the hierarchy of paragraph styles is a huge time saver in Affinity Publisher. And that's it for tip number three. Working with multiple languages is increasingly common in the global economy, and you'll often find yourself having to work with multiple languages in a single design. In this case, I have a business card that needs to be in both Spanish and English. Now, when I go to do spell check, that 
would normally present a problem. So let's go to window and go to pre-flight. And we can see that everything's spelled correctly, but it's flagging the two Spanish words. And we don't want it to flag the Spanish words. And we want to make sure that when we run spell check and right click a word that is misspelled that we get Spanish options, not English options. So we can actually control this from the paragraph styles panel. So let's drag out our text styles over here. We can see the heading two is applied to both of these. And I'm going to just create a character style that contains the setting for Spanish. Let's go over to the character panel and I'll just drag that out so we can see both. And make sure that this second box is selected. I'll select all the text in that by triple clicking on it. And on our character panel, we can see down here, we've got a section for typography and another section for language. Right now it's set to English. So let's change that to Spanish. And I'm gonna create a character style for that. Up here where it says no style, I'm just gonna create a new style and call this Spanish and click okay. Now I have a Spanish style down here at the bottom, so I can just click on that to apply it. When we look over here at our pre-flight panel, we can go ahead and check now. We can see that there are no spelling suggestions because it is recognizing those Spanish words now. And if I triple click on this and select one of these words, it no longer gives me English suggestions because it doesn't see it as being spelled incorrectly. All it gives me is the option for look it up. And that's it. So now as we go through the document, if we have other things that need to be Spanish, all I need to do is just apply that character style and spell check will automatically recognize it for me. Throughout this tutorial, I've been using assets from Envato Elements, like these business card templates and even the motion graphic templates used in the creation of the video. I put together a collection over there and there's a link down in the description. And if you'd like to grab these assets, plus millions more that will speed up production and improve your workflow, head over to envatoelements.com. Creating personalized versions of a design is tedious and it's not something that's particularly fun, but it's one of the most common tasks that any designer ends up having to do. So I've got my business card here. We've got some filler information like the name and just a generic Facebook account rather than having the actual account for this person. So let's import some data from HR. We'll go up to window and I want to open the data merge manager. It'll bring up this little window on the bottom left corner. It has a button to add a data merge source. When I click that to bring in a source, I just need to select my CSV. I've got this test CSV here. So let's go ahead and select that and click open. And I'm gonna check this box for preview with records so I can see their names and the actual phone numbers, but I'm not going to click generate just yet. I'm just gonna close this. Instead, I'm gonna go up to window again, go to references and open the fields panel. Drag this down here so we can see a little bit better and just collapse some of these options since we don't need all of these. We have some default options here, like the document information and statistics, where we find like page numbers and things like that. And can add fields for those. But what I'm interested in is this data merge and test data.csv because that's the file that I brought in. And we can see all of the different columns that we've got here. We've got a sequential number, we've got a first name and a last name, age, street and address, all this good stuff. So I just want to replace the the filler information that I've got here with some of the fields from this panel. So let's go ahead and select the first name. I'm going to double click on the name underscore first. Do the same thing with the last name. Select it and then double click on name underscore last. Do the title, just double click on title. Same thing for our Facebook account, I think that's social one and same thing for social two. Now, right now we're previewing the information from that test data.csv. If I go back up to window and go to my data merge manager again, I can jump through the different records and see what different names are gonna look like. Once you're happy with your design, you can go ahead and click generate and Publisher will create a new file with a personalized design for each person, all on individual pages. All we need to do now is 
send this off to make sure that everything is spelled correctly, get approval from the department that requested new business cards, and we're ready to send it to the printer. Going from InDesign, you might find the guides in Publisher are a little bit confusing at first, but they're actually really powerful. And here in tip six, I'm gonna show you why they're so incredible in Affinity Publisher. To add columns and rows, you're actually gonna find that on the view menu and go down to guides. In this menu, you'll be able to add rulers, both horizontal and vertical, and you can also add columns. So if I wanted to add four columns and four rows, I just need to drag those sliders up. We can also edit the gutter between all of them. So we'll give it a little bit less gutter. We can also change the preview for these. I tend to use outline so it doesn't interfere I tend to use the outline view so it doesn't interfere with my colors, but you can change that to filled if you prefer that as a little cleaner look. You can change your margins here as well, but you can also change your margins on the document setup, and you can also edit your spread origin. One of my favorite things to do in this menu though is use the percentage setting to create ruler. So if I want a ruler that's exactly 50% of the way across page from top to bottom, that's where it's going to start at default, but maybe I want that to be 25% of the way. So it's exactly a quarter of the way from the top. All I have to do is change that to 25% and it does it for me. I don't need to do any math or figure out where exactly it should be. I just type in percentage right there and let's go ahead and click close. So I've created this layout on page one, but it has not been applied to pages two, three, or four. What I'd recommend doing when you start a new document is creating your rough guides on the master pages. So let's go to master A by double clicking on it. And we'll go ahead and do the same thing with our guides. We'll go to view and then go to guides. And this time we'll add our four columns. And I think I'll just go with three rows this time, a little bit less gutter and then go ahead and click close. We can see this applies to both pages on the spread. It doesn't apply to just one page, but both pages in a spread. And if I go to pages two and three, which already have master A applied, we can see that it has that layout done for me. And if I wanna create a new slightly different layout based on that theme, all I have to do is right click master A, duplicate it, so that we have a B master. We'll double click on that and go into the view menu, go to guides again. And maybe for this one, we'll set it up so that it doesn't have as many columns and instead has just two rows. Go ahead and click close. And now I can apply master B to just pages two and three, and then pages two and three have a different layout. This is a really quick way to just get your basic ideas down and get something that's procedural that you can change later on down the road as you're adding your wireframe and you need to shift things around. And even though guides are a little bit different in Publisher, I definitely love the way that they're set up now that I know how to use them, and now you do too. And that's it for tip number six. For designers, math typically isn't our favorite subject, but we still end up having to do it quite a bit, especially when calculating layouts and making sure things are nice and precise. But Affinity Publisher will actually do a lot of that math for you. All right, here are my infographic. I've got these three bars and I just want them to scale down and correspond to the percentage that we have here on the right. So let's go ahead and select one of these. I'm gonna be using the transform panel to do this. So let's drag out the transform panel. Just put it right above the bars. Now I've got this little collection of squares over here on the left. These are my the anchor points. And I want these all to scale down to the left. So let's go ahead and click that left center square so that it scales down to the left and to the center. Now we've got our width of 203 points and our height of 19.3 points. It really doesn't matter what these numbers are because we're just going to multiply by the decimal to get the percentage. So this first one should be 42%. And assuming these bars are all 100% right now, let's go ahead and just multiply it by 0.42. And I'm using the asterisk there to multiply, press enter, and we can see it's scaled it down now to 85.6. So the same thing with this one. Again, we'll just multiply using the asterisk 
uh, 0.78. Perfect. We got it 78% of what it was before. And we'll do the last one here. This is 94%. So we'll just multiply using asterisk again by 0.94. And it's now 94%. Now, you can do this with pretty much any field that accepts a number, even rotational degrees. So this is a really, really powerful tool. Never need to open your calculator app ever again. When you start to get really, really long documents, when you're making like a textbook or something, things can start to get really, really unwieldy, really, really fast. Fortunately, Publisher has a great way to manage really, really long books, and it's called, unsurprisingly, the book tool. So let's go up to file. And instead of going to new, we're just going to go to new book. It will open up this panel over here on the left. And down at the very bottom, we've got this add chapter button. When I click this, it's going to open up Finder or Explorer on Windows. And we can select any other Affinity Publisher files that we want to be our chapters. So I've got all of the different demos that I've been using for this video. I'm just going to hold shift and select all of those, click open. And it's going to go open each one of those here in the books panel as a chapter. And this is really, really powerful because it means that first, I don't have to have one document open with absolutely everything in it and slowing down my computer. I can break it up into individual chapters. Another thing that's really powerful is that with this little key right here, it's saying that this is the style source, which means I can actually select these. Let's go ahead and open this one. And I'll go ahead and open business cards and go up to the hamburger menu. And I can just synchronize settings and it will synchronize swatches, text styles, or table formats, and master pages across all of those files. So when we do that, it's going to apply those styles to every single chapter. And that way, if I need to manage styles, I don't have to scroll through a huge document to do it. I can just go up to my master, change whatever I want in the paragraph styles, and apply that to all of the other chapters. This also includes a page count feature. So as you add more documents, it will keep track of how many pages are in each one and add those pages up. So you can still use your fields to add page numbers. When you wanna save your book, all of this is done from this hamburger menu and the books panel. And we can just go to save book, give it a name, and click Save, and it will keep track of where all of our documents are, and then each one of the documents will link to its individual images separately. It's not a feature that gets covered a lot, and it's not something that I really devoted any time to until recently, but when you are working on really, really long projects, it is a massive time saver. And that's tip number eight. Keeping your text readable, but also having really interesting visuals is always kind of a challenge. In Publisher, though, we can use text wrap to fit the text around our images. Let's look at this triangle here as an example. I'm going to select the triangle and then up at the top, we'll just go to text wrap and make sure that's set to tight then click close. As I drag this down here, you can see it moves all that paragraph text around for us, which is really nice. It doesn't move any of the artistic text around, though. So it only affects text that's in a, a frame text box. And there are two different types of text boxes that you can use, and you want to keep that in mind whenever you're using text wrap settings. We have the frame text tool in white over here on the toolbar, and then we also have the artistic text. Artistic text is not affected by wrap settings. Now, let's go ahead and move this triangle out of the way and just delete it. What about our image here of our model that we cut out earlier in tip one? Well, Publisher actually uses transparency in raster images as well. So if your image has an alpha channel, whether it's a PNG with transparency or like we have here uh, an image that we masked earlier, it's going to use that mask or the transparency channel in your image to make the text wrap around. Let's have a look at how that works. I'm gonna click the image and let's double click again to get into that group. And I do want to expand this out and make sure that I have the image selected, not the image box or the picture frame. So now that I've got that selected, we can see it's got the mask there. And if I go up to my text wrap settings, we'll just set that to tight. You can see 
it immediately pushes all that text around. So the text is not going to touch our image at all. And we can actually go in here and if we move our image around, our text will always get out of the way for it. We don't have to rearrange our text boxes or anything. We have to worry about is making sure that we don't have any overset text. We can also add a little bit of padding around our image too. So we can select the image with transparency and the wrap settings applied. And if I want to push the text just a little bit further away, we can make sure that it's at least four pixels from the left, four pixels from the top, right, and bottom. We can also link all of those. Just click close. We can see our text now just a little bit further away. This is really, really handy and a great way to make sure everything stays readable without having to constantly be moving your text boxes around to keep them away from your images. If you like adding texture to your designs, but don't want to have to search through your folder of texture images, tip number 10 is definitely for you. I'm just going to select the background in this planet and we'll give it a gradient and add some noise to that gradient. So we'll change the fill type from solid to gradient and go ahead and apply that using this fill tool in our toolbar or G on the keyboard. And I'll just drag that across. Now that the gradient's applied, we'll leave it set to linear and we can switch it around if we want, but I'm going to go ahead and open up the colors and tweak each one of them. Select the knot that you want to edit, then click the color. I'm going to make this one a little bit more blue and a little bit lighter. And down at the very bottom, we have a noise setting, which essentially just adds a little bit of procedural noise. There's no need to add any images or go searching through your stock library. It's just right there built in and it's really, really fast. The nice thing is that we can also control how much noise goes onto each knot because each knot has its own noise setting within that color panel. So let's go to the second knot. We'll edit that color a little bit. I'm going to make it just a little bit more green and I'll add a little less noise for this one because I like to have kind of a variation where it's smooth in some spots and textured in other spots. And now as we move around, you can see the noise updating and it is procedural. So as you zoom in, you can see it's going to get more and more detailed. And that's it for tip number 10. One of my favorite things about Affinity Designer is the way clipping and masking works because it's really, really fast and it's the same in Publisher. Okay, we've got the planet from the last tip and I just want to clip it to this iPad shape. We can position the planet over here and then in the layer stack, I'm going to drag it down so that the rectangle is highlighted blue. If we drag it so that the thumbnail of that layer is highlighted blue, that's going to be a mask. But if the entire thing is highlighted blue, that's going to be clipping. So it's essentially clipping to that shape. When you drop it, it'll turn that into a group. Now you still have control over the layer itself. So you can still go in and change its background color. And if you want to move this item around that we've clipped to it, you can select that within the, the clipping group. So we can scale that down and position it wherever we want it here. You don't need to use any hotkeys or anything. It's essentially the same as just managing layer groups in your layer stack. As your projects get more complex, you end up spending more and more time just selecting the items that you want and trying to find them in your layer stack. In tip number 12, we're going to talk about selection tags, which will really speed that process up. If you go up to the top and go to the select menu, this is a really, really powerful menu and you have lots of options here, but I want to be able to select just these plus signs. Unfortunately, if I go to select same and try fill color, it's going to get everything with that light gray. So that's not exactly what I want. So let's go ahead and get one of these. I'll go over to the layer stack, hold shift and select all of the other plus signs. Now, instead of going to the selection, menu. I'm just going to right click and go all the way to the bottom of this. We can see these little colored dots. I'm going to apply a red tag to this and we'll just deselect. Now, if I click any of these, we can see in that layer stack on the far right side, it's got a little red mark next to it, indicating that that's the tag applied. So all I have to do is select one of them, right click and go down to select same tag color. We can also add tags by name too. So you can have name tags instead of just colors. But this is a really quick way to make selections when sometimes it's not feasible to have things separated by group or they might be on different pages 
we can go ahead and apply a tag to them and speed up that selection process immensely. If you've dealt with images that come in different formats, like a landscape image and a portrait format image, you know that it can be kind of challenging to fit them all into a nice grid system. But as graphic designers, that's what we end up having to do a lot of times. Here in this template, I've got a couple of images that are exactly that setup. One is a wide format and one is portrait format. And unfortunately, if I move them around here, they just scale down and get squished. And that's not what we want. A better idea is to go ahead and put in a wireframe. Even though this is a template and already has most of the stuff that we need, it pays to go ahead and set up a wireframe anyway, because it'll help us manage all of these images. I'm just gonna delete these two for now. And instead of importing the images directly, I'm gonna go ahead and place some picture frame rectangles with the picture frame rectangle tool. And I can be pretty loose about this for now. I'll just drag one out to duplicate it. We can select it, hold the Option key, and drag it over. I'm also holding Shift to make sure it drags in a straight line. I'll hold Shift to select both of those. And then again, holding the Option key and dragging down, we can make more duplicates of those. And I just need one more, so holding the Option key and the Shift key to drag that duplicate there. Now we've got our rectangles. And we can go ahead and place images right into those frames. So we'll go up to File, Place. I'll go ahead and select the five images that I need, and then click Open. And it brings up this menu over here on the left with the Place Images panel. And you can see that they're all just in queue waiting to be placed, with the one on top being the next one in queue. And we can hover over any of those frames that we created and see it's going to give us a preview of what it's going to look like in that frame. All you have to do is click once to place the image. It'll go to the next one in queue, and we can go ahead and place the rest of these. Now, it looks kind of the same, but everything is now clipped to those frames. And if I go back to the selection tool and select a bunch of these frames, we can now move this around and scale it. And instead of squishing our images like before, it's going to crop them. And we can actually change that behavior as well. So for instance, if we wanted it to fit in a slightly different way, we can select that frame, right click it, go to frame properties, and select one of these different options here, like scale to min fit. We'll make sure that the entire image fits in the frame. I'm just gonna undo that. And instead move this over slightly, we can use those little arrow keys to just move that over so that she's framed within that box. This one here, we can move over a little bit too. We can also see that he's filling that frame up a little too much. So in this case, this one, we might need to scale down a little bit and then fill in with some background edits in the photo persona. And now I just want to make sure that these are all pretty much the same size. And that brings us to the next tip, snapping. When you're doing your page layout, it's really crucial to make sure everything fits in a nice grid. And fortunately, Publisher is really, really good about snapping. If I want to scale these boxes up so that they're exactly the same width as our name tags underneath, you can see it's not snapping. And it's because the snapping menu, while really powerful, has a lot of different options that can be kind of confusing. So let's look up here at this button for snapping, which is our little magnet icon up here. And currently it's enabled, but it's not working. So let's click the drop down and see why. Up at the top, we've got some presets and then we have all these different options here. And we also have candidates, which is typically gonna be set to immediate layers. I'm gonna change this preset to page layout with objects. And I'm also gonna change candidates from immediate layers to all layers. And now it will go ahead and snap to those name tags for us. It's also snapping to a whole bunch of other things, and that's why you might want to limit it to only snapping to things in a specific set of layers or hierarchy of layers. The reason it wasn't snapping before is that all of our text objects are on a separate layer while all of our picture frames are on this picture layer. But now that we've enabled snapping across different layers, we can go ahead and scale all of these so that they exactly fit our name tag sizes. And as we do this with more and more of these, it'll start to recognize what we're trying to do. And you can see all these different lines popping up that it's showing what it's 
matching in terms of size and in terms of position. So we can see all these little green arrows here, like the 52.3 says that it's now matching all of those picture frames. And as it detects that pattern, it'll start to get smarter about what it's snapping to, making our job much faster. So now that we've got more and more of these set up the way that we want them to be, it should be really, really easy to get them all snapped exactly where we want them and clean up that layout. All right, last but not least, tip number 15. This one I said would be a surprise, and I think it is kind of a surprise even as simple as it is, but it's the availability of adjustment layers right here within Publisher. We don't even need to go to the photo persona to add an adjustment layer. We can do it right here on the layers panel within Publisher. So for instance, maybe I want to have all of these images be black and white. All I have to do is go into the layer stack and we see we've got a mask button, adjustments and effects, just like we might see in Photoshop or Affinity Photo. And I can click on adjustments. We'll go to the black and white adjustment and it will create a black and white adjustment layer for us right here. It is going to affect everything in this layer stack, but we can also crop this and mask it to just these picture frames. Let's go ahead and drag a box to mask it. I'm going to create a rectangle with the rectangle tool. I can just drag that out over the entire thing here. And then I'm going to drag that and drop it on the icon of the mask adjustment layer. So now it's not going to affect anything else. It's only going to affect those images right there. And then we can still go in and edit our adjustments. So it's a completely non-destructive workflow, just like adjustment layers and other applications. We can go in here and tweak our colors until we are happy with whatever we've got here. We can even do separate adjustment layers for different photos. So since all of these colors are quite different for different photos, we might find that we want different black and white adjustments for different photos. So let's go ahead and close that to accept it. I'm actually going to release that layer mask, or we'll delete the layer mask. I'll just drag it and drop it on the thumbnail. And now we're doing black and white for just that photo. So we can go ahead and duplicate that. I'll do Command C to copy and Command V to paste. And we'll just crop this one to this photo right here. And then we can go in, click on that adjustment layer options. And now we can manage this image separately. We can do, again, all of this without ever having to go into Affinity Photo or any other app. We can do it all right here in Publisher. We can get really, really creative with our overlays. If you're a designer who likes to use lots of different blending overlays, this can be really, really powerful when you combine adjustment layers with masks. And that's it, 15 tips for Affinity Publisher. I'd love to know your tips down in the comments. And of course, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to leave those down in the comments as well. As always, like and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this and learn more about Affinity Publisher or any other software for that matter. Make sure to enable notifications too so that you get new videos as soon as they come out. I've been Drew and I'll see you in the next one.